All right. Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you guys are in the world. Always good to see you here. Hey, put in the chat where you are. It's awesome to see people tuning in from all over the world. We have a really special guest we're going to bring on in a minute. I just wanted to say hi and give you guys an opportunity. There we go. We're get, getting you guys rolling. Um, well, listen, let's get this event started here right away. I'm Mark Silver, if you don't know me, photographer, author in Carmel, California. And our show today is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. And listen, here's the thing. You know how much I encourage you guys to make prints. Get off of just being digital and get into the print world. And here's the thing. Bay Photo will help you do that. There's 15% off on fine art prints. These are all specials that you can go to their site and find. These exposers are actually pretty cool. That's what I have behind me. They float on the wall and they're 30% off. Those are pretty neat. Bob Holmes has a bunch of those. Canvas wraps, you can get those. And as always, you can get 25% off on your first order. And listen, here's the deal, you guys. We're going to give you guys a... a one of you lucky people is going to get a print at the end of this show, so make sure you stick around till the end. Okay, well, listen, I want to introduce you to our guest. Ed Kashi is an acclaimed photojournalist who uses photography to explore social issues. You can see in these images, and you'll see in a moment some of the other ones we're talking about. Um, he's a dedicated educator, very generous in his teaching. He's been a mentor for many photographers. We've had him on originally in 2010, I believe, Ed. We, I met you yep. at Palo Alto High School. Now, here's something amazing, Ed. Think about it. That was 11 years ago. Those kids that you were talking to, I think it was the senior class, Palo Alto High School, they're out in the world. I wonder, yeah. you know, it'd be interesting to track them and see if any of those guys became pro photographers. Yeah, it would be. We'll, we'll, or we'll what have they're do doing. And what they're doing. Anyway, if you, any of you guys are tuning in, I'd love to hear from you. That would be really amazing. His visual storytelling has led to projects including National Geographic, The New Yorker, M M MSNBC, Fortune, New York Times Magazine, and a lot of other places. And he's won a zillion awards. And Ed... We're really happy to have you back with us on Advancing Your Photography. Thanks Thank for joining you, us. Thanks. And welcome, everyone. Yeah, we see a lot of people tuning in over here, so that's great. All right. Well, Ed and I got into this conversation maybe, I don't know, two months ago. I asked you because I was, at that point, I was kind of on this topic of debunking myths, common myths in photography. And I think this is a good place for us to uh, jump in on this. There are some big myths out there, and I know you answered this, and I asked you, what are the biggest misconceptions or false beliefs in photography? And you gave me an answer, so why don't we start there? Okay, and you can, te you can test my uh, memory. <laughs> okay, I'll, I remember what you said. The first thing you said was, it's easy, and you know, why, why is that a false belief? Oh, that photography is easy? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I was just in New Mexico, actually, for a, 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 a digital arts festival that I have peace in. And we went to the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. For oh, those yeah. of you who don't know who she is, you should, you know, she's a uh, wow, powerhouse human and a trailblazing woman in particular, you know, in the last century. But um, she was um, in some ways uh, not adopted by, but, you know, definitely with with alfred Alf, um alfred stieglitz one of the alfred great stieglitz. They, they became you know an item and he kind of took her under his wing when he i think she was just in her 20s and we're talking about like 1918 or 1920 yeah. anyway but well the reason i brought this because he was in many ways alfred stieglitz responsible a hundred years ago for establishing photography as an art form absolutely so up until that point which what photography at that point is 60 years old, some, somewhere around 60, yeah. 70 years old, it was never really accepted as an art form. And I think that- He was also Ansel connect, Adams' mentor and got really kind of launched his career. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. In New York. He had a huge impact on on many people and the photo world, the art world. Um, but um, you know, when you scroll to the moment with your question about you know that you know is photography or photography is easy. It's not that it's easy. It's just that it's accessible, especially with smartphones now. It's accessible to virtually not anyone, but the majority of humans on Earth right now. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, regardless of your socioeconomic background, because in general, photography has always been more of a, you know, upper middle class, wealthy person's game in a way. You know, it's always been a pretty and still remains an expensive uh, uh, thing to do, you know. But but anyway, but so I don't want us to mistaken the accessibility to cameras, the, 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 the ease to which you can make an image as opposed to, like if I said to someone who's never picked up a camera, you know, here's a camera, go make a picture. It's very possible they might make a picture that will blow me away because yeah. they will they will be conjuring something from the conscious or, you know, sometimes the untrained eye is the most interesting eye. But if I said to someone, you know, go write a novel or an essay or paint a picture, that's very difficult to do unless they're just gifted in that way. So I think we don't want to mistake in the ease to which we have access to the equip to the tool and the ability to make some kind of an image with making a great photograph. Yeah. Because to make a great photograph and obviously one of the beautiful things about photography it's it's about everything in the world. So yes, you could go out sunset as a novice and make a beautiful picture. But if you're doing reportage or documentary work or something that involves access into people's personal lives, that is not something that is easy to do. Right. And I think it's good to have your mind prepared for what it's actually going to take. You know, I used to teach mountaineering and we would start off with very simple things that people thought they already knew how to do, like walking. You know, if you walk incorrectly, you, if you go speeding ahead and then you stop and you keep changing your rhythm, you're going to get worn out. And just the, the basis of learning photography is it is a long process that we're into here. It's a, it should be a lifelong love affair, not something that you just dabble at. That's right. We hope. That's right. I uh, know. And I think it's interesting. I will say to address the moment we're living with Instagram and the smartphones and the clear global obsession with images and image making is um you know that there's something that even for the mature let's say i hate to make these distinctions obviously for me this is a lifelong dream this is my life yeah i can't imagine ever not making photographs until the day i die i think there are many people as i call them civilians in the world who might in some ways feel the same way that that you know where photography has evolved it's become such an integral part of our lives, how we not only capture our and, sh and preserve our moments, but now to share them in real time uh, and then to get feedback in real time. I know for, uh, for especially younger folks, this might sound like stupid or obvious, but you have to understand this is relatively new. Yeah. My sure. gosh, what is it, Mark? 10, 10 years at most. 10 years, Ten years with Instagram, yeah you know where you'd be able to you had a device where you can make an image share it globally and instantaneously get feedback yeah it's really powerful didn't happen and um you know and it's and it's beautiful uh i mean there's negative aspects to all of this as well but it's a beautiful thing that um you know earlier this week i went to a yankee game with my 23 year old daughter and made the pic you know make a picture of ourselves and send it to my family and within a minute you know it's it's this connection, you know, that they'll, they're sending a heart or a lot or thumbs up. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, again, there are probably like emotional and psychological negatives to this because <laughs> we're probably losing some purity in uh, how we live our lives, not to make this into a psychological uh, yeah. session. But on the other hand, there's also something beautiful about it that we can connect. And, and it's that idea that we're connecting through images. Agreed. Let's talk about the next thing you mentioned, which was shooting under ideal light. 
uh, lighting conditions as, as, an, as an area that, because I asked you also, you know, when you're teaching workshops, what are the, some of the things that you have to overcome or, or help your students with? And you showed us, you, you gave me this image as an example of not shooting under ideal lighting conditions. Tell us what's going on here and, and what happened and why, what, were the, what were the lighting conditions? Yeah, and I, so I want to preface this with an anecdote. Um, years ago when I was in mid-90s when I was, you know, starting to work with National Geographic on a consistent basis. And I remember I was working with a writer there who had worked a lot with Will Albert Allard, one of the masters of, of um, color photography, certainly. And I said to the writer, you know, oh, man, the light really sucks. And he looked at me and said, well, Bill Aller says there's no such thing as bad light. It's just bad photographs. <laughs> and true. so, which, of course, back then I was like, yeah, screw that. Jim. You know, anyway, easy for him to say. But so scroll to the present and all those years, decades. between, <laughs> And what I come to the way I interpret what I think Bill was saying is that it's really how you see light. So. In this case, this was an image made last year in Nicaragua as part of a ongoing project about kidney disease. And in Nicaragua and Central America, it particularly affects sugarcane workers. Uh -huh. So, and I've been in the sugarcane fields in that region and other parts of the world many, many times. And, you know, the reality is, as with so much work done as photojournalists or documentarians, we can't choose when we are going to need to make a picture. You know, it, our, the conditions are generally dictated by the subject matter, by the characters, by the dynamics of our, um, of this topic or the story we're covering. So in this case, you know, whatever, it's 11 o'clock or midday, the light is horrible. You know, there's maybe a little bit of like diffusion in the sky because yeah. it's humid, but basically you've got direct midday sun. It's like a hundred degrees. You know, as a photographer, you'd be like, get me the hell out of here. Right. I'll come back in five hours. Well, I can't do that. So what do I do? I look, I look at what I look at. Where is the light actually falling? You know, and then I'm examining. OK, so the white hats, those are going to be like impenetrable highlights. But what I can do is pick an angle of approach where I use the light almost to sculpt the scene you know, so that I'm working with form in this case, you know, or action. In this case, it's mostly form. Yeah. And then, and then allowing, you know, okay, it's not going to be beautiful, warm, textured tones because it's harsh, but still, and this is the beauty of working in Photoshop now, where we have the digital darkroom, especially in color, that, you know, then you can in post production tone down some of those highlights. So, yeah. so in brief, I, I think the, the key takeaway when you either want to or have to work in quote unquote bad light is is don't just deny it. Look at it and look, you know, so maybe let's say in this case, not to belabor this point, but I wasn't interested in their faces. If I wanted to capture their faces, then it would have been very difficult, right. frankly, in this light. Right. But uh, unless I waited until, you know, they're at the apex of their movement and their faces is reaching towards the, the the light source towards the sun what i was looking here for is form and action a sense of place and the other thing to remember is sometimes like in this case the fact that it's hot beating sun is part of the story because this is about the impact of heat stress on workers there you go another thing that i'm, I'm just going to move to this next image because we were talking before we actually went on the air about Gaining access, and I think that's a huge point a lot of people want to know about it in, in terms of photojournalism or street photography. And we have this image. And tell us about how you gained access and what, what was going on here. Yeah, so, I mean, we're, I was, Mark and I were talking about this before we went on. but So this is also Nicaragua. And it's from the same project, but this image was not made last year. It was made, I think, 2013 or 2014. I've been working on this project now for almost eight years. And um, 
This is the funeral of a sugarcane worker who had died from this disease, a chronic kidney disease of non-traditional diseases. And that's the, that's the focus of, of this ongoing project. And so it was one of my first times visiting, this is in Chichigalpa, Nicaragua, which is like the epicenter of this disease in Central America. And, you know, it, as I was remarking uh, to Mark uh, before we went on, is like sometimes I look at images like this and I wonder like, you know, how the hell did I do this? Like, you know, as I'm getting older, I have, I've grown kids, you know, I've now experienced so much in my life, both through my work and through my personal life, that I'm actually way more sensitized than when I was 20, 30 years old, even 40 years old doing this work. I'm way more sensitized to my impact on the scene. You know, when you're younger, generally speaking, that isn't to say there. I know some incredibly sensitive folks in their 20s who in some ways know things about this idea of uh, access and sensitivity that it maybe took me 20 or 30, frankly, to truly understand. But um, I guess so anyway, when doing this kind of work, it's, uh, it's so important to think about your impact on the scene. Now, in this case, um, you know, the people were really welcoming, were warm, um, I had um, people from the community with me, working hand in glove with me, so that I knew, for the most part, my presence had been explained to them. Right. So they had gone to the, you know, the grandparents and the, you know, the the, the wife who's been left behind to just in in this sensitive uh, d- and discreet way explain this is who this guy is, this is why he's here, and then. What you get in, what what happens in when it's you know in the perfect world, is then you get actually the buy-in of the people because then they realize okay this this cider is here to tell our story, and it's a story that is killing or sickening seventy percent of the men in this community. Amazing. So, you know, in this case, you know, thankfully, thankfully they accepted me, and I hope I didn't hurt anyone or trample on their, this sacred ceremony for them. But this is part of navigating doing this kind of work. And this is why this kind of imagery is not easy to do. Yeah. That in a sense, the photographic part is the easiest part, if you like. And it's everything that you do on a human level, on a logistical level, especially a human level, to get yourself to this time in this place in time and space where this is happening and you've gotten proper permission and you know allows you to work and it's still difficult i'm i was crying while i was taking this in making this image and you know i'm you know you're hearing the cries of the daughter like you know where's my father in spanish where's my father it was like a dirge over and over again everyone is like bawling their eyes out because it's just such a sad scene yeah. Well, let's t- thank you. And and I really appreciate what you're saying about your sensitivity as you grow older and, and, and really looking at what your impact is. I think that's really an important lesson for all of us to learn. Let's talk and, about And I just want to give a shout out that, that a lot of this, this, what I consider new awareness of, in this field is because of, you know, the, the, younger folks in the field who, you know, like in so many of the changes that are going on in our society now, which I think are for the most part, very positive and forward looking is that, you know, when I started 40 years ago, nobody told talked about this stuff, right? It was like, Oh, I'm a photojournalist. I work for XYZ publication, whether it's National Geographic, or you know, whatever the Charlotte Observer, whatever it is. And I have a right to be here. I have a right to, you know, to go to your funeral and because I'm, you know, you know, but that's not enough anymore. That's the point. That is not enough anymore. Yeah. And I really attribute this, this awakening to the younger generations, um, you know. So anyway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two things before we move forward. Will you guys hit the like button? Because that actually helps youtube let other people know that we're having an amazing show here and if you haven't already done so and i should have said this earlier subscribe and enable the bell so there's a little bit of 
business out of the way. Uh, Ed, the other thing that you brought up was shooting in manual mode, and you're kind of leading into it here. Here you are in this really intimate, you know, setting and many of your other photographs. You know, do we have time to start fiddling with the camera when you're trying to capture this moment? So we were talking about this beforehand, and that I believe is one of the common myths on the internet, which is, hey, you know, a real photographer shoots only shoots in manual, and you got to shoot in manual, and yada right. da. So tell tell us tell us about that. What you, why is that a myth? Yes. Yeah, so um, I mean, again, I can't speak for all the photographers out there, both professionals and amateurs. But what I've what I've come to see, and again, I came from the world of you know shooting color slide film or black and white film but in particular color slide film where if you were a third of a stop off in your exposure when you were photo i was photographing for national geographic or fortune or time or any of the major magazines the picture was on was generally unusable unless it was you know uh, a, a, an event of such historical significance that they do whatever they could to yeah. pull out the, the, the image. But when, in terms of just aesthetics and, you know, proper exposure, it was, it was, un, it was unyielding, you know, the, the, the precision that we needed. And I, and I accomplished that mostly through using a handheld light meter and learning how to read light, how to see light. And then the whole idea, you know, Ansel Adams, eight percent gray, you know, where is, so so now when i i work 90 percent or more of the time in in uh automatic mode automatic exposure mode and i prefer shutter preferred as opposed to aperture preferred because i want to know my shutter speed because i want to i want my unless i want to have blur in my images or movement i want to be sure that my images will be rock solid in terms of no camera movement and no movement of the subject matter, unless I want it. Right. And so therefore, that's why I always work in TV or, or shutter preferred. And then um, unless I want a large depth of field, meaning a higher aperture, then I'm not as concerned about my aperture. So that's my mode of working generally. Right. Um, and um, so the way I use my, my meter is with a you know the i use canons the back button uh um, exposure lock but what i'll do is i'll i'll use also the spot metering system you know the spot metering mode in my camera so let's say uh this image that's up now isn't a great example because it's flat light so yeah. it's easier to read but if there's an image let's say where there's a little more of a contrast um um, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's say this. Yeah. This is not exact, but so I'm going to figure. I'm going to look at Dean, and I'm going to go. Okay, where's the 18% gray? I would say it's on the man's T-shirt. Let's right. say that's a that's a that's a fair to go to. Not up in the you know God's light highlight, you know smoky shat, and not in the deep shadows. Or in the I glass. I want to look yeah. for that. Yeah, I want to look for that neutral. Exactly. Not in the glass. Not on his skull cap. I want to look for the most neutral. If you like what, well, you know, in technical terms, 18% gray spot, I'll point my meter at that and I'll lock that in. Then I'll recompose and work away. Because one thing I learned early on in doing this is that photography, you're always, photography, you're always dealing with variables. It's a, it's, it's a set of variables. And my goal is to reduce those variables because I don't want to be obsessed with te te the technique and the technical stuff. I want to be obsessed with, you know, this man's cheeks and the angle of the rod and the sun light and the, you know, light coming in from behind. And, you know, what's the guy in the background doing? And, right. you know, what's that circle on the left? And, you know, I want to think about the composition and the moment and the emotion. I don't want to be thinking about F stops and shutter speed. So my way of accomplishing that is reducing the variables. And one way I've done that when it comes to exposure is using shutter preferred mode, n nail the part of the frame. Uh, maybe if there's one with a, with a, uh, a horizon line, but yeah, not that's like dusk. Uh, uh, we had one earlier. Here, let me go back up this one. Maybe is that? Yeah. Although the light is a little dim, but let's just yeah. imagine this scene and it isn't uh, whatever at dusk where the light is pretty 
flat and consistent. Let's say it's three o'clock in the afternoon and you have a bright sky and you maybe have like the dark blue or green of the water. Then I would point my um, meter at the horizon line. In mm -hmm. other words, I want to go point it at a place where, you know, basically, you know, half of the frame is filled with sort of highlightish area. Half of the frame is filled with um, the shadowy area so that I can get an average reading. Now, there are also times where I might decide, let's go to another picture. Let's see if I can. Uh, sure. Um, Stop uh, me when you. Know, okay. Uh, okay. Let's say this. So there might be times where I want, uh, this isn't a great example. But let's just say where it's like I've got. The, 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 the sort of velvety, rich, deep darkness of the woman in the foreground, her, her top. But then you have the sort of either the white of the man's shirt or their skin tones. And so, oh, my God, if depending on where I point, depending on what I read off of, I could totally blow the exposure on this. Right. So in this case, I'm going to, again, look for the, the average area. But there are times where I might want to underexpose the frame. Okay, in which case then I will go to the brightest part of the frame and I'll take my reading off of that or vice versa. So the point is, the point is that if you shoot in auto mode, you don't do it blindly. You still need to think, you still need to have your photographer's hat on and your photographer's eye and your knowledge and understanding of exposure and highlights and midtones and shadows so that even though these are like nanosecond decisions i'm making splits because this is also a scene that's not going to stay so i can't be diddling around for 10 seconds five seconds these are split like second yeah. decisions. but all this comes from experience it's like being an athlete okay here's a good example you have deep shadows and then you have that that facade, which is the highlight area. Yeah. In this case, I would have pointed my camera, my shutter, sorry, I would have pointed my meter at the highlight area right. because I want it to be deep. So I hope that makes sense. And yeah. like with anything, you know, I always feel like everything I've learned, I've basically borrowed or I've observed what others say and do and then borrowed it and integrated it into my own practice. That's a, you know, a really good way to, to, uh, to learn anything. And I've, I'm completely in agreement with you. The other thing, Ed, that you brought up, and I, I think the balance of our discussion, we can take a look at this. You mentioned, um, you know, again, in teaching other photographers, that they need to have the patience, and as you put it, to let the magic happen and let, mm -hmm. let the scene uncork. And let, let's talk about that, because I think... This is maybe one of the downfalls in our instant world of photography and instant world of everything, that if it doesn't show, you don't see the image like in the first 10 seconds, you just go on to something else. Rather than what you're talking about is you're in a scene that you know something's going to happen that's remarkable, but you might have to wait around and wait for it to to materialize, right? Yeah. So, and I'm, I see that in all your images. Um, well, it's one of the greatest challenges, really, of doing this kind of work or, you know, street photography in many ways might be, well, no, I would just say, but street photography is very different than doing, let's say, intimate, um, you know, um, journalistic work. But, but it's similar in that patience is one of the, the greatest, um, 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 what's the word, I mean, talents or attributes, skills yeah. you can have attributes exactly and because so often and i have to tell you Marty, but i i when you were talking bringing this up i was thinking about even now subjects or people are more impatient <laughs> yeah you know that i think that in general our world is more sped up so you know so often i find now when i'm when i'm working on a, on, on something where i need to let's say repeatedly visit a subject or spend a lot of time with them i I can see that there's been a qualitative change even in, and I'm not just talking in America, I'm talking many places in the world, that we're all more sped up, to, we're all a little more impatient. And um, I remember years ago, this was uh, between 96 and 2003 when I was working on my Aging in America project. Now granted, the subject matter in general moves slower, you know, elderly yeah. folks, but that there are times where I'd like fall asleep in people's living rooms watching TV with them. 
you know, because nothing was going on. And it's funny, it's hard to imagine doing that now in today's really? world. Because even those elders back then, if they're today, they'd probably be on their smartphones. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> it's a different so, world. So, but but there's something so beautiful. Oh, there's something so beautiful when you can get into that rhythm, whatever it may be, but the rhythm of the people you're with or the place that you're in, you know, that's part of like the Zen of it in a way. And it's yeah. easy to do, but I'm telling you, if you can do that, and maybe in some ways when you're not like working as a professional, it's easier because you won't maybe feel the same pressures. I don't know, but, but um, when you can get into that rhythm, it, it's magic. It's just magic. And then it's like, it's as though, you know, there's like a new, you have new eyesight because then you start to see things that you didn't see when you were rushing or when you were antsy, you know, and, um, and that's part of the magic of photography really is it yeah. is a, it's, it's, it, it, it does afford us that opportunity to look at the world anew. And I love this image because this, I think to me is an example of that where you have frames within frames but you had to wait for that gesture and you were yeah. you're invisible and you 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 waited for the moment where it all came together if she just had yep. both hands on the wheel it would be completely different right but you totally and it, actually this is from the aging project this was in florida i believe and this woman she was basically someone who who she was a breast cancer survivor she had had a mastectomy and she her she basically had uh, at that point in her life um, committed herself to um, counseling younger women who are either dealing with breast cancer or survivors of it. So she's in my eyes, like such a hero and so cool. So I'm, you know, I'm driving with her to, I think an appointment and, you know, I'm just sort of, it's always this idea of like, you're observing people. It's sort of creepy too doing this kind of photography because, you know, I'm like, I'm, you're observing people so keenly yeah. in a way that would be, if you didn't have a camera, they would think like, what is wrong with you? Stop looking at me <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, and you know, and so I'm watching her, you know, she's full of energy and she's so excited about what she's doing and, you know, she's gesturing. So then I'm like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for lining up the shot, the image where I get a good reflection of her in the rear view mirror and then I get her, her hand gesturing yeah. and, you know, thankfully it came together ultimately. That's the decisive moment. Let's take this question from Hector. This is a good point to bring up. When do you decide when you're shooting in black and white or color? Well, uh, previous to the digital revolution, which, yeah. which sucked me up by 2003, 2002, 2003 is when I converted to digital photography. It was always a very conscious decision because it meant I was investing hundreds of dollars, if not more, in film stock right. for a project. For a project, and so generally, all my personal work prior to the digital conversion was in black and white, and then virtually all—not all, but ninety percent of my assignment work you know, National Geographic, all the major magazines were color slides. So, you know, I often didn't have a choice except rare moments where I could sell an idea or I was requested to photograph in black and white film. But post digital, basically we're RGB photographers, you know, we're, sh <clears throat> we're shooting in color, but um, we now know that we can convert to black and white and have it still look absolutely beautiful. So, you know, that's one of the few laments I have, <coughs> excuse me, about the digital conversion is that uh, there was something very exciting and rewarding about knowing, you know, I'm doing this on black and white exactly. film stock or I'm doing this in color slide film because it also meant technically I had a different set of challenges to deal with. Right. I will say that, 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 that in that sense, photography is much easier now. <laughs> yeah, and do you generally decide later or do you kind of have it visualize it at that moment well i know this is going to be a great black and white or this is definitely a color do you, or do you do that when you're processing it's well you know i have to tell you mark at this point it's pretty much i'm all, always shooting in color now yeah. that that is again one of my great laments is that you know i for me black and white was my first language 
and color was my second language. Yeah, and now too. color, yeah, it was really, it is the main language. And then if I, um, you know, there are times where, where like subsequently after I'm finished with a, with a project or a, or a shoot, I'll, I'll say, you know, I think this will be more powerful in black and white and I'll make that conversion. But uh, I generally don't like to mix color and black and light white within a project or uh-huh. within a, you know, within a, a yeah, a, a group of yeah, within a project or within a story. So, you know, whether I decide before I'm working or after I shoot, um, I will, you know, generally be the it'll be a universal decision. Right. And. I really appreciate what you've gone over and there's some you guys need to really like watch this again there's a lot of meat here that that he covered is there any anything you'd like to leave with these viewers in terms of just becoming better photographers whether it's photojournalism or whatever their genre is or anything yeah or anything. I mean I guess yeah it's um well, I guess one thing is don't let the the deluge or tsunami of imagery that we live under dissuade you from making your own pictures. Um, the more personal you keep it, the better. Not, and I don't mean better just in terms of the quality or impact of the images you make, but your own your own personal satisfaction. Whether that's a picture of your your baby or your daughter or a friend or. A, your house, whatever it is, whatever it is, you know, just um, just be passionate about what you photograph and and think of the camera. And I've said this so many times, but it remains as true as ever. It's like a diplomatic passport into worlds you otherwise would never get into or you would never see. So true. Ed, thank you. And you've certainly used that passport very well and seen a lot of things that most of us will never get a chance to see and i think that's the beauty of what you do as a photographer is you're showing and that's something uh alfred stieglitz actually said i'm trying to show people what i saw and felt yeah and yeah, you've, so you've done a, you've done a great job at that thanks for joining us again ed all right thank really you all right it. take care mark take care everyone okay have a wonderful day Wow. Okay, you guys, a lot of information there. I do want you to watch this video again and take good notes. There's We covered a lot of ground from the technical sides of photography, exposure, you know, why you don't leave it on manual and use your spot metering, but also the human side of the of what we're doing here. As, as human beings, we are behind the camera and we have to be mindful of, of what we're doing and the impact that we do have on others. I think that's incredibly important. Okay, so uh, as promised, we're going to give you guys somebody here through the magic of uh, Jared's magical, uh, I don't know what he does behind the scenes. I do random <laughs> number generator. <laughs> okay, there we go. So uh, one of you guys so. is going to win a photo from Bay Photo. All right. Uh, and our winner for the stream is Greg uh, Hassenstein. Okay. I believe that's it. Uh, one of the fellow Iowans. We had several Iowans in here. I'm from Iowa myself, so it's there fun to see that. Uh, so congratulations. And uh, just I'm putting in the chat the email to send to me so that I can get you in touch with Bay Photo. Because if I don't get your email then I can't get you in touch with him. So Okay, uh, Greg, make we'll sure you, you in touch. reach out to Jared. He's also in Iowa. So congratulations. Get a great print made. Show us what you get, too. I'd love to see it. And uh, congrats. Okay, listen, if you guys are not in our AYP Plus class, you should really be there. And I'll tell you why, because we are right now in the middle of projects, and you can join anytime and start your project anytime. But... Through the summer, everybody in the class has chosen a certain project, and we critique those photos every single week. This is basically modeled after what happened, what I did in art school. We all chose a project. Every week we showed up, we put the prints on the wall, and the instructor and the whole, and the whole class went around and critiqued our work. So you get feedback not just from me, but you also get feedback from the other members of the group. It's really important to get 
intelligent feedback and critiquing on your work. So Jared will put the link in there. You guys can join anytime. AYP Plus. It's a members only experience. It's not like out on the, the whole world. So everybody in there is um, there because they're like-minded photographers. And Jared will put the link there. So to answer your question, how can I join? You'll, you'll be able to just click on that link and join. And we have classes every week. We have assignments you guys are on. Uh, generally, I give a short class for maybe 10 or 15 minutes about some topic that's relative. And then the rest of the class we're doing our critiquing. I'd love to and see it. It is not there. too late to join. You it's know, we're doing projects all throughout the summer. Don't think that, uh, you know, it's already the end of June. Can't join. That's nope. not true. Anytime. Not true at all. Yep. Also, if you guys don't have a copy of my book, Advancing Your Photography, you should get one. And I've got a special on it. Basically, I'm giving you the book. You cover the shipping and handling, and you can also order my other books digitally, and Jared will throw the link in there too, so you guys can easily do that. You know, it's not a bad book. I, I spent years and years and years prepping for this book through my interviews with people like Ed Kashi and Bob Holmes and Dan Milner and all the other great people that we've had on this show. So... Um, dive in and you can carry it around with you. I mean, that's great to have videos, but a book is really handy when you're out in the field and you want to look up something or you want to just be reminded of, uh, you know, some topic, whatever. You can just flip the book open. You can get it for under 10 bucks in the U.S. And it's a little bit more foreign, but uh, Jared will put the link in there so you guys can grab it. It's advancingyourphotography.com. All right, we are fully into summer, you guys. This is the time to take advantage. You might have a little more time on your hands. Doesn't matter if you do or you don't. Make sure you're dedicating time to getting out and photographing. This is really important. You know, things don't happen unless you make time for them. They don't just automatically occur. You have to make time for your photography and that's important. Take these points that Ed went over today and practice them. Practice them. Use them. Put them to use and see for yourself, you know, the, like he said, the magic, letting the, letting the scene unfold. Really carefully looking. You know, he talked about that Zen kind of looking. Really looking at the scene and pressing the shutter at the right moment. Try these things out. Okay. So AYP Plus, we're meeting again on Tuesday. So if you guys join today, you can join us on Tuesday. And that's about it for now, except to say I want you guys, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe, enable the bell, like the video. It helps us. And leave your comments. I love seeing your comments, and I will reply to them. And share I love it if you guys share these videos. And the last thing, and you can say this along with me, is remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Take care. Love you guys. See you in AYP+. And we'll see you really soon.